Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Church Online. Another beautiful day here in Arlita at First Assembly of God Church. Just want to welcome you once again, and thank you for joining. And I want to also say thank you so much for your prayers on behalf of Terry and myself. We have just been out of commission with just a nasty virus. We did COVID testing like three times. They always came back negative, but it was just a... Uh, a really nasty flu virus and so we do appreciate your prayers remembering us lifting us up to the Lord in prayer and we're so happy to be kicking again also wanted to say thank you for your prayers for our daughter Christy as many of you know uh, she had an emergency uh, surgery to remove a brain tumor and this was in uh, in November and uh, she has been had to go through 30 days of 30 treatments of radiation and she's completed that so we're thankful that she's come through that and she has a lot of strength a lot of energy and her faith is strong in the Lord so we're uh, looking forward to connecting with doctors this next week to find out how the radiation treatments went but thank you again for your prayers they mean so very very much to us and in particular Christy is always saying Please express to the good folks at First Assembly of God our Leader, thank you for their prayers. They mean so much to me is what she said. So we do want to say thank you. We appreciate and love you so very, very much. Well, we're going to be turning our hearts now to the Lord in worship, to praise and worship to the Lord. And it's not very difficult to do that. It's not very difficult at all to raise our voices, clap our hands, raise our hands in honor and praise and glory to the Lord for who He is and for what He has done in our lives. I mention this so often, but it's so true. We used to sing this hymn when I was a kid in church, count your blessings, name them one by one, the chorus went, and it'll surprise you to see what God has done. So let's just take a moment now and let's count our blessings as the worship team leads us in praise and worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's worthy. Amen? He is worthy. Let's worship together.
Well, thank you so much, worship team, for leading us in praise and worship. And isn't it true, it's not difficult to worship the Lord when we reflect upon His goodness and His many, many blessings to us. Well, we're going to jump right into our message this morning. And for the next several Sundays, we'll be going, we'll be moving through the book of Acts. A very, very exciting, exciting book as we see the Holy Spirit at work in followers of Jesus Christ. And so... I'm certainly excited about uh, moving into these passages and being able to just uh, really just sit back and watch how the Holy Spirit worked in people and through people and out of people. And what an exciting thing to know that He hasn't stopped working. He hasn't stopped doing great things in the lives and through the lives of believers. He's still at work today. And so I just want to just jump into our message this morning. And I want to begin with a passage of scripture that has just stuck with me for the past several months. Usually pastors, followers of Jesus will ask the Lord for a special passage of scripture that they can look at throughout the new year and call it their passage. And there's a passage of scripture that I wanted to share with you that has stuck with me and it's probably a passage that will be sticking with me throughout the year. I love it. I, I, uh, I love it because it's packed with the heart of God, our Father, who is so desirous of relationship with you and with me, with our loved ones. Some of them who know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, oh, the Lord just enjoys fellowship with them. There are some of our loved ones who aren't in relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and our Father is desirous. Uh, he wants to embrace them and love them and forgive them and to be in relationship with them. And so this passage of scripture that I'm going to share uh, is found in, in Luke chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. And you might be thinking right away, hey, wait a minute, I think that's a Christmas passage. And if you thought that, you're right. And I want to just share it with, with us just before we move into the first chapter of the book of Acts, because I think it sets for us a wonderful foundation to recognize and to realize what's taking place in the book of Acts. Listen, we find this in the first couple of chapters in the books of, book of Acts, is that it's, it's opening day for the church. You know, there are many baseball teams right now, the Dodgers, the Giants, the Padres, there are many, many of the Major League Baseball teams right now that are in spring training. And they're, uh, they're pulling their teams together, and they've got players, players that they've added to the team. They've signed free agents. Some of their folks in their farm systems have, have come to the place where they've developed and they're ready for the Major Leagues. And so they're, they're getting prepared right now for opening day. And opening day in baseball is a tremendous, tremendous day, especially if you love baseball. And that's when everybody has done all their hard work, and it's opening day. It's the first day of the season. The stadiums are packed. There's excitement in the air. And at the crack of that bat, boy, the crowd just goes crazy. Well, it's opening day. If you've ever been a part of Little League, you probably know what that's like, opening day. It's a, it's a really fun time to see all the little leaguers um, with their uniforms on. Some of them know how to run to first base after they hit the ball. Some don't, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a fun thing. But on opening day, you'll see each team announced, and that team will walk by the uh, press box, and people are going crazy, parents are going crazy, because it's opening day. Everything is being kicked off. Well, the church had an opening day. And that's what we'll be looking at, not so much this morning, but next week we'll be looking at the birth of the church. If you want to know what a Bible-believing church should look like, what that church should be doing, how they should conduct themselves, you need to look no further than 
the, the, uh, the book of Acts to see the blueprint for the Lord's church, how it is to operate and how it's to function in society. And so we'll be looking at that. But I want to just look at again here in this passage of Scripture. Let me read it. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn to <coughs> Luke chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now you can imagine yourself, a shepherd, minding your own business, you're out in the, uh, you're out with, in, in the pasture with the sheep, you're there to watch over and protect them and all, and then all of a sudden, you're approached by an angel. And it says, and the angel said to them, because if you and I were there, I'm sure we would be pretty frightened. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I give you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Well, why? He goes on to say, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And you shall, and this shall be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, after the angel shared this message with the shepherds, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude, a lot of them, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, worshiping God, praising God, and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth goodwill toward man. And you think, well, well why was this such a glorious time? Well, in the, the, the few verses preceding the angel's message, a baby was born to Mary and Joseph, and it was Christ the Lord. This was, this was God's plan. This had been God's plan for, for thousands of years leading up to the birth of Christ. And the whole, the whole uh, thing there was is that God was once again... Emmanuel, God with us, offering us this salvation. He's offering us uh, a relationship. He offers forgiveness of sin. Uh, he did it then. He's doing it now. He'll do it in the future. And, and really, when we look at the book of Acts, and we see the birth of the church, it's all about God the Father's plan in sending His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and raise from the dead three days later to bring hope and forgiveness and help to those who are in need, to those who are depressed, to those who are suffering from, from anxieties, for those who were, were moving through life with just an empty feeling, knowing that there was something more, and Jesus comes and he dies on the cross for the sins of all mankind and, uh, and raises from the dead. On the third day, this was God's plan. This was God's desire <coughs> that he bring salvation to mankind. So we move to the book of Acts now. We use that back really as our, as our backdrop. This is, this is God's plan. This was, this was in God's heart to reconcile and restore relationship with mankind. And then in chapter 1, the, the uh, book of Acts, it says... The, the former treatise have, have I made, O Theophilus, of all, and listen to this, of all that Jesus began to both do and to teach. And I think those uh, five letters there, B-E-G-A-N, began. It's what he began to do. Now Luke wrote the book of Acts, but he also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so these are two volumes that Luke wrote. The book of Luke from the Gospels, and then the book of Acts. And he's saying to us, listen, I've written about the stuff that Jesus Christ has done. I've written about the healings. I've written about the miracles. I've written about how he was a teacher above all teachers. I've, I've, uh, I've written that. I wrote how he went to the cross, uh, how he died on the cross, the sacrificial death for mankind. I wrote how he arose from the dead. I wrote all those things. That's what he began to do, but he's not finished yet. 
is what Luke is saying. And he goes on, he says, verse number two, until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. He was sharing some things with them, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. These were some of his last words. Anytime you're around anybody that has some last words to share, trust me, you are all ear. Some of you may know that. You may have been by a, a loved one who didn't have a lot of time left, and they're trying to get some words out. And boy, your ear is there, and you're catching and listening to every single syllable that comes out of their mouths. You, 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 it's important because you know they're not wasting their words. And, and here is uh, Jesus, his last words to them. He says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them. In other words, he said, hey, listen, I'm going to share some things with you. He said that they should not depart Jerusalem, but they were to wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And the scripture goes on to say, uh, verse number six, it says, when they were therefore come together, they asked him, because he'd been sharing with them some truths. They said, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And remember, they were under Roman rule. They were, they were in essence, slaves to Roman rule. They weren't a free people. And they were, they were waiting for this Messiah to come to set them free, to set up the kingdom. And, uh, and so they thought that this was going to happen. Um, but, Jesus, but Jesus said, listen, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But, and this is the key passage for the book of Acts, and I think for us this morning, he says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses. You'll be witnesses. And why is it so important that these 120 that he's ministering to, that, uh, that they be witnesses and carry this message, this gospel message, it's because God the Father wanted a relationship with them. Wanted to forgive them of their sins. Uh, to bring life to them. He said, you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and in the utter, uttermost parts of of the earth. And so the, uh, the disciples, as we know from this passage of scripture, they returned uh, to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, verse number 12. And, uh, and they came together and they went up into the upper room where they abode with Peter, James, John, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James. There was, uh, there was 120 followers of Jesus. And it says they were there and they continued with one accord, they were in unity, one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. What a passage of scripture. And there are just, just three quick points that I want to share this morning with us that if we will follow, if we will follow this command that Jesus gave his disciples followers of Jesus, he says in chapter 2 that, uh, that this which is taking place and this which, which has taken place that was spoken to the prophet years uh, in advance, he said, it's for you, it's for you, it's for us, it's for those who are living years from now is what he said in this, in this book. And so, and so Jesus, he's, he shares this with them. He shares these three things, and the big word I think there is wait. Um, they were committed. These 120 were committed. They were anticipating Jesus being with them. They weren't sure exactly what was going to take in place. He shares with them these, uh, these teachings of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and then he ascends 
to the Father, and there they are with the command to go and wait for the promise of the Father. Now, can you imagine how they must have felt? Here, Rome had just put Jesus to death on the cross. He had risen from the dead. There was a buzz that went throughout the city because so many had seen Jesus, the risen Christ. They'd seen this, and so there was a buzz, and, and uh, things were a little bit tipsy-turvy in the city at that time. And so the disciples, they, they do several things. Number one, <coughs> number one, they wait in obedience. The second thing they did, they waited together in faith. In faith, believing, stepping out. And then the third thing is they waited in prayer. They waited on the Lord in prayer, which was the key to it all. And so they, so they come to us, uh, these, these three commands that Jesus anticipated and expected them to be obedient to, and he really does to us as well. He expects us to be obedient to his word. And so they come from Jesus, and he said, but you're going to receive, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So these 120, they made choices, and the choices that they made it altered their lives, it altered their world, and it made a difference. The reverberations of it are, we're, we're still sensing it today. Uh, the church, it continues to, to go. It's had some tough times in the past, but it's still alive. It's a movement that continues to grow and move forward. So the first thing, he said, you know, wait in obedience. Uh, wait in obedience. It was a uh, it was a commitment that they made. Uh, I resolve that I'll listen. There was a lot of activity going around them. They didn't know if somebody was coming for them, or or, or exactly what. But they were resolved. They weren't going to let the culture, the uh, the society they were living in, press them into fear and into their mold and running from them. They said, listen, uh, um, and, and we should as well, that we're going to be what God wants us to be, um, that we're going to be what God wants us to do, and we've got to be willing to fulfill the plan of God for our lives, not somebody else's, but God's plan for our lives. Listen, we may not understand it, but by faith, we're going to move forward in obedience to the call. Well, what is commitment? Well, commitment is doing what I said I would do long after the feeling I set it in has passed. Commitment. Commitment. And after Jesus had finished his words and sharing with them, and, and they embraced Jesus' words, he, was, he ascended. And from that moment, it... it uh, it took commitment, it took courage for them to move forward in spite of maybe the fears and concerns they may have had. Well, the second thing is, they were to wait in faith expecting. They chose to live by faith rather than fear. So they went to this upper room and they began to call on the name of the Lord. Um, faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I'm confident that they were in that upper room. And they were studying the scriptures from the Old Testament. And we know they were probably uh, um, studying the scriptures uh, because they received direction from the scriptures in appointing a new apostle to take the place of, of Judas. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then there's the, the, uh, the third thing is, uh, is wait in obedience Wait in faith, believing. They didn't know what was going to happen. We know the end of the story. They didn't. They just went in faith. He told us to do this, and because he told us to do it, we're going to do it. And they did it, not knowing what the outcome would be, but wow, what an outcome there was. And God blessed their faith, their expectation. And then the third thing is wait in prayer. The main point 
in what Jesus was speaking to them when he said, uh, listen, uh, go and, and go and, and, and wait, because you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you. Uh, and so the main point is, is prayer. Have you ever noticed this here? And I want us to think about this for just a, a few minutes. Have you ever noticed that Jesus launched the Christian church not while somebody was preaching, not while somebody was singing, not while some people were sitting around a, a board table trying to plan and getting ready for whatever may be coming. No, it's interesting to me that the church was birthed out of a prayer meeting. They were praying and they were seeking the face of God and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And those that were around, and we'll get to this next week, but those that were around heard them preaching and talking about the wonders of God. And so the, uh, the disciples were doing <coughs> nothing at this point but waiting on God as they were sitting there worshiping in community. Um, and so we, um, so we move from uh, waiting in obedience to waiting in faith, expecting to the main uh, point of, uh, of, of, of waiting by God in prayer. And that's what they were doing. They were allowing God to shake them and to cleanse their spirits and, uh, and to do, you know, a heart operation on each and every one of them that only the Holy Spirit can do. And only can He do it in times of prayer. And that's where and how the church was birthed. And that's how it was born. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon these 120. So think about the power of this passage. The church was birthed in a prayer meeting. Not a concert. Not a convention. Not a seminar, but at a prayer meeting, and out of a prayer meeting. And it causes us, I think, to ask the question today, is what is the prayer meeting like today? What's the prayer meeting like in your life, in your home, with your family? What's the prayer meeting like? You know, at Good News Club, we have the privilege of praying in the, the public school setting with boys and girls in the after school programs that we have and we're able to read the scriptures and tell Bible stories and, uh, and it's caused me to think many times in the past listening to people uh, you know so concerned that prayer has been taken out of the school or the scriptures have been taking, taken out of the school that I remember when I was um, younger, it was a, it was, it was such a massive deal when prayer was no longer allowed in the school. I remember in kindergarten, first grade, probably is dating me, right? But how prayer would be shared in the classroom, God would be shared, the pledge of allegiance would take place. It was, it was okay to have your Bible with you. It wasn't a foreign thing to see the Ten Commandments on a wall. And yet, uh, so many folks were in an outrage that prayer was taken out of the school. And yet, I thought on many occasions, how many of those same people have missed the prayer meeting that's been called at church? Uh, you see, folks, there's nothing like prayer. There's no substitute for prayer. Communing with the Lord, he said, my house will be a house of prayer. Uh, it's what he longs for. Um, with us. And so we see that, there, you know, in, in this book of Acts, there's just a, uh, a powerful book, really, of the activity of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and we never see John and Peter, Paul, wringing their hands and saying, you know, what are we going, what are we going to do? Look at this society that we live in. Uh, perhaps we should do a protest. Perhaps we should get some of the uh, the Congress people, the Senate people that we know, to do some things. Maybe we should boycott. No, 
They didn't do any of that there. But I think you know exactly what they did when you read through the book of Acts. They weren't wringing their hands. They went straight to the prayer meeting. And they called a prayer meeting. And um, in verse number 29, it says this here. And I don't want to get too far ahead. But in chapter 4, verse 29, it says, And, and, they say, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness that we might speak thy word. Not turn these people away, not cause something to happen to them, not hide us, but, oh God, give us a boldness to face anything that comes against us. And then it says here in verse number 31, And when they had prayed, they gathered together, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with tremendous, tremendous boldness. Oh, what an exciting thing for us to, to read about. You know, I want to just um, read a quote. I'm just going to read a quote from a Bible translator, J.B. Phillips. You may have heard of his name before. But in completing his work on this, this section of the Scriptures, the book of Acts, he couldn't help but reflect on what he had just really observed and had given himself to deep study. And in 1955, the preface, preface to the first edition of the book of Acts, he wrote this here. And I want to just read this here. It says He said, It's impossible to spend several months in close study of the remarkable short book of Acts without being profoundly stirred and, to be honest, disturbed. The reader is stirred because he is seeing Christianity, the real thing, in action for the first time in human history. The newborn church, as vulnerable as any human child, having neither money, influence, nor power, in the ordinary sense, is setting forth joyfully and courageously to win a pagan world for God through Jesus Christ. He said, yet we cannot be, help feeling disturbed as well as moved. For this surely is the church as it was meant to be. It is a vigorous and flexible, for there are days before it, before it ever became fat and short breath of breath through prosperity or muscle bound by over organization. He said, these men did not make acts of faith. They believed. They did not say their prayers. They really prayed. They did not hold conferences on psychosomatic medicine. They simply prayed for the sick and they were healed. But they were, they were uncomplicated. But if they were uncomplicated, he said, and naive by modern standards, we have to ruefully to admit that they were open, they were open on the Godward side in a way that is almost unknown today. Open on the Godward side. Open on the Godward side. Doesn't that just stir your spirit? Doesn't that just you know, light a fire inside of you. That, that one brief phrase sums up the, uh, the tremendous secret of power in the early church. A secret that hasn't changed for over 20 centuries. The clearest instructions about the church life and about church life come in the pastoral letters from the Apostle Paul as he speaks to young pastors. We see this every year at the ordination service of the SoCal Network conference when the ordinees come forward and they're charged and they're prayed over and together. And you always hear this passage of scripture. Um, but Paul, he speaks to, to young pastors such as Timothy. And the apostle <clears throat> couldn't be more direct than he was in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. He said, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Why? Why, first of all, before anything else, is Paul speaking these, this to these young pastors? Well, because Timothy, my son, he, he would say, 
you've, you've, you've just got to remember that God's house must be called a house of prayer. It is an activity that must take place in the house of the Lord. And that's prayer. And then later in the same chapter, verse number 8, Paul says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer uh, without anger, without disputing. He said that is the sign of the Christian church. You know, in the book of Revelation, if you were doing your a chronological reading the Bible through a year, um, in December, uh, I came across this passage of Scripture where in the book of Revelation it says that when the 24 elders eventually fall at the feet of Jesus, each one will have this, this golden bowl. And do you know what's inside that golden bowl? Um, uh, it's incense that is, a, that is a fragrance fragrance to Christ. And what that, that incense is and the fragrance of Christ and, and what's in those bowls, if you'll read the scripture, is it's the prayers of the saints. Can you imagine that you and I, when we kneel or stand or sit, however we talk to God and worship Him from our hearts, um, it's so precious to Him that He keeps it like a treasure. He keeps it like a treasure. The Bible has these promises. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7 says this here, Ask, seek, knock. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. In Jeremiah 29, 13, the Bible says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Uh, you have not, James says, chapter 4, verse 2. You have not because you ask not. Listen, friends, really isn't it time for us to just to stop everything, to take a step back, and to recognize and realize that, listen, the, uh, the way to victory, the way to the heart of God, the way to be used of the Holy Spirit in ways we never thought of is to spend time with Him in prayer, calling upon the name of the Lord. I know there's, there's tons of books and there's tons of podcasts. This person saying this, this other person says, do this, do that. Um, but really it all comes down to this here. It all comes down to the Bible and your knees. The scriptures, the word of God, and talking to God. Listen, he wants to use you. A savior has been born, which is Christ the Lord. A savior has been born. Listen, you've come to know Jesus Christ because somebody shared him with you. And listen, you have people all around you, probably family members, that may not know Christ, may be in desperate need of forgiveness for the Lord. They don't need to be reminded about their, their, their sinfulness. They need to be reminded and talked to about the love of God and the power of the Spirit who wants to set them free. That's what the book of Acts is all about. That's what what Emmanuel, God come in the flesh, is all about. Jesus coming to walk amongst mankind to feel with us, to reveal what God is like, and then to ultimately, in obedience, go to the cross and die for the sins of people, of you and me. Went to the grave and he rose three days later. He's alive today. There's an, another uh, another commentator, uh, J.B. Phillips, he points out this in talking about prayer. He points out with this powerful insight, he said, The Holy Spirit has a way of short-circuiting human problems. Indeed, in exactly the same way as Jesus Christ in the flesh cut right through the matted layers of tradition and exposed the real issue, so we find here, in the book of Acts, the spirit of Jesus dealing not so much with the problems as with people. Many problems comparable to modern complexities never arise here because the men and women concerned were of one heart and of one mind in the spirit. And since God's Holy Spirit 
cannot, cannot conceivably have changed, not even one iota through the centuries, he is perfectly prepared to short circuit by an inflow of love and wisdom and understanding many human problems. Listen, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. For us, we go A, B, C, D, E, F, but we've got to go through those letters to get the F. Many times the power of the Holy Spirit will leapfrog over B, C, D, E and get right into F. Listen, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Today we uh, <coughs> excuse me. Today we seldom get to the place of, of 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 a raw honesty before God and admit to saying, Lord, I can't do it without you. I can't make it in my own life without you. I've tried. I've tried to overcome this. I've tried to overcome that. I've tried to be good in my own strength. But we can't do it. We need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I like an old hymn of the church that we used to, that we used to sing. It went something like this, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. God says to us, pray, because I have a lot of things and a lot of blessing for you. When you ask, you'll receive. He says to us, I've got all the grace, and you live with such scarcity, tons of grace, tons of mercy. And yet sometimes we can live as paupers. And so Jesus calls to you this morning. He calls to me. He calls to us as a church family. He says, come unto me, all you who are heavy burdened and heavy laden. And he said, I will give you rest. What a promise. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us. We, uh, we pray, oh God, that you would help us to be obedient like those 120 were. And they saw such miracles done as a result. You used them. You worked through them. And you touched a world through them. Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, uh, the uttermost parts of the earth. Lord, uh, you, you did it through them. And you want to do it again through us, to the culture, to the neighborhoods that we live in, to the schools that we are a part of. We ask you for a new, fresh infusion of the Spirit of the living God. May He fall on us. We ask for a fresh wind. We ask for a fresh fire in our souls. Lord, that only you can give, but we're desirous. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you. Come, sweet spirit, we pray. And we we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. And amen and amen. Well, God bless you, everyone. I'm looking forward to our time next Sunday morning as we move out of chapter one and into chapter two. And we see the birth of the church, really opening day of the church. So we look forward to connecting next week. Uh, together. God bless you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.